on Larry King Now, Judge Judy. She's been behind the TV bench for 17 seasons. I have a subliminal message. Once we've helped you, get off your butt and help yourself. Plus, we'll talk politics, gun control, and much more. You have to take a test to give a pedicure, but you can go and buy a lethal weapon, including an assault rifle, with nothing more than your driver's license. Judge Judy is next on Larry King Now. Judy Scheinlin is an old and dear friend. She's not old, just the relationship is old. She's the presiding judge on Judge Judy, gearing up for its 17th season on September 10th, the number one syndicated show on television. So happy for her, and I welcome her to Larry King now. Thank you. How delightful of me to be sitting opposite you again. Yeah, we've been through a lot together yeah, over, the, over the many years. In a little while, I want to talk about the horrific news out of Colorado, but first, some other things. Are you, do you look at your, are you surprised at your own success? Every day, every day, but you know, after a while, when you feel good, it's like having, it's like having a bad backache, you know? You, it feels bad every day, but once it goes away, it goes away, you hardly think about it. Well, I used to pinch myself every day, and then it was once a week, then it's once a month. But every once in a while, and I'm lying in bed, and I say to myself, how did this all happen? Do you look at yourself now as a judge or a television personality? Both. I, you know, having enjoyed these two fabulous careers, um, I know that I'm a lawyer. I think, still think like a lawyer. I know that what we do is entertainment, and it's, if it's not entertaining, nobody's gonna watch, and that wouldn't be the business. But I don't have a script. Like, you don't have a script. We talk. Right. And we talk in evidently a language that people find appealing, so they keep coming back. So I know it's entertainment as well. Uh, but I think with both sides of my brain. What's it like to no longer have any financial worries? Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than well, not having It's one. better than not. But you know, Larry, you appreciate things more. Yeah, you do. And I was saying to somebody recently, there was time for the great majority of my life that Jerry and I would go shopping, we'd go into a department store, and I would say, Gee, I wish I could afford to buy that. I, you know, people who spent hundreds of dollars on a pair of shoes, I thought, well, crazy, should be committed. Now you do. Uh, and when you do have the wherewithal to buy what you want, I find that it's, it no longer has an appeal for me. I can wander into a store and I would say, what do I need that for? You know, I have a shirt at home. And I find that I wear the same things Is over there anything and over. you splurge on? Any? I splurge on my children and grandchildren. I like to know that they are secure and that at least that financial stressor that so many young people have of college loans, not being able to get out of their parents' house because they can't afford rent, that those stressors hopefully I can help them out with so that they can move on with that little bit of stress free. On the other hand, you really have to worry that if you take that away from a young person and they don't have that hunger in their belly, they may lose the drive to succeed. It has to be a balance. A couple of things about the show. The, the production company pays whatever the settlement is, right? Production company will pay the judgment if there is a judgment. Do you ever get bored? Never. No? Nope. nope. Do, Do you? Anything. No. No, I don't. No. Nope. But I get different people. Well, yeah, you get different cases. Every case is... Every, uh, case is. every case is different. Every person that you interview is different. Uh, and, every, they, and often challenging. Do you think you've improved on what we think of as right and wrong in this country? You certainly have had some effect. Well, you know, I have a subliminal message. I could, you can't be on that long in the kind of work that I do without having the message. And my message is take responsibility for what you do. If you have children, be prepared to support them. You have to pay your taxes. You have to be a productive citizen. If you're having a temporary setback, we as a good community, as a good country, and good citizens will help you. But once we've helped you, get off your butt and help yourself. That's my message. 
And if that's right and wrong, well, then I'll do a mea culpa for you. But there are more people in this country that appreciate that than appreciate those folks who seem to be on the taking end always. Were you a tough family court judge? Yes. That's a tough element of law. Uh, I interviewed a federal judge once who said one of the problems he faces when he was, a f he was a family court judge is, how do you train to who gets the child in a custody suit? Where does your learning come from? Well, I think your learning comes from tough area, good Laura, instinct, uh, not coming with any predisposition. We're supposed to, in this country, treat mothers and fathers the same with regard to custody. No one is, has a less equal position. However, when I practiced in the family court and then was later a judge in the family court, I found that that law was honored in the breach. Most judges and most psychologists that served the court always thought that the mother was better. And I didn't always find that that was true. If you want full-time responsibility for a child and you're prepared to accept that as a guy, which is not a natural role for a guy, more of a, for a nurturer, and what we perceive as a nurturing mother, there has to be a reason. So I think that you have to have a mix of common sense. You have to know the law. But you have to have a sixth sense of people. The great Louis Nizer, who I'm sure he, I, I yes. interviewed him quite a few times, a great, great, great lawyer, lawyer, said that the worst cases, he stopped doing them, were divorce and custody cases, that the hatred in that courtroom was worse right than the victim of a crime sitting against, behind the person who committed the crime. Not, so you had to proceed in cases where people hated each other. People hated each other. And, that, and some of the other cases that family court has jurisdiction over are equally as difficult. You know, we deal with the termination of parental rights in family court. And you, it was always hard for me to understand that a man was convicted of a triple murder. He's in jail. He has three little kids. One of the people he murdered was the mother of these three children. And yet, he's fighting tooth and nail so that his parental rights will not be terminated to those children, even though he knows he's never going to be able to parent them. But he doesn't want anybody else to parent them. Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. <laughs> wow. You only work five days a month? You make all this money? You, cut, you live in, in Venice? You live in Jackson Hole, <laughs> you live in Connecticut, you have a private plane, you work five days a month. What, what, how did you get this gig? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What do you do, well, you work, cases a we, day? What do you do? No, we do 10 cases a day. We do a week's worth of programming in a day, which, you know, is a lot of work for, for people in this entertainment industry, but not a lot of work for a family court judge. I used to do 60 cases a day. You know, you started 9 o'clock in the morning and you worked and it was a grind and you took 20 minutes for lunch and you came back and you did what you had to do. So I'm used to getting things moving. I had really good training. Before we started, Judge Judy told me that, funny, on her show today, not funny, cases involved guns. We're going to talk about that mass shooting in Colorado and her take on the election next. Back with one of my favorite people on the planet, Judge Judy. We talked about having gun cases in your own court. The most mind-boggling thing to me is the Second Amendment. What were they talking about? Were they talking about a militia or your right to have a gun? Why? I, I, I don't like to talk about my personal things, but I had a guy from Scotland Yard on once who could not comprehend that Americans could go in and buy handguns. It was beyond his belief sense. Well, what do you make of this? Colorado, what do you make of this? I don't know, because I don't think anybody can understand what goes on in the mind of a madman who would, could contemplate doing something like that. And yet, today I had two cases that I tried in my television courtroom, two cases that involved guns. One of them was a lovely man whose next-door neighbor had dogs that he perceived to be vicious, who had, according to him, 
traumatized his family over the course of several months. Well, he opened up his garage door one day and the dog came, according to him, charging at him. He took out his 22, which he had in his pocket, which he wasn't supposed to because it was supposed to be a house gun. He didn't have a carry permit. And he shot at the dog, towards the dog. Didn't hit the dog, but hit his neighbor's garage across the street. His neighbor sued him to get the money to fix the garage door, and he turned around and sued the owner of the dog, who was the cause of him shooting the gun. Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. interesting. So I said to him, what if there was a child behind that garage door? What if when you took out your gun, instead of scaring the dog, you hurt somebody, you killed somebody? I'm sympathetic. He said, well, I have to protect my family. I said, you may have to protect your family, but there's a reason that we require people to have a permit to carry a weapon whether it be training, whether it be licensing, because that was surely poor judgment on his part to take out a gun in a busy neighborhood right. and sh shoot the gun. What do you make of the ac Americans' access to getting guns? Okay. It seems so, absurd. I really think that if you have, if you are able to pass a test, first an IQ test, hmm. and then a test about the gun, and then a psychological test or a psychiatric test, but before you can get your hands on a weapon, you have to establish that at least there's some reason and that you're a capable person. I mean, my grandson just had to take certification to go scuba diving. You know, you have to take a test to give a pedicure. But you can go and buy a lethal weapon, including an assault rifle in many places, with nothing more than your driver's license. It's that part of it, to me, is ridiculous that you can do it with impunity. You can get, you have access to these kinds of weapons with impunity. In how many cases in America is a home invaded by a thief carrying a weapon threatening your house? I'll bet none today. Maybe one. What do you need guns? What do you need a handgun for? I don't know. I don't know. Now, there was somebody who said that in the theater in Colorado, if there was one person who had a gun that was well-trained, they might have taken down this lunatic. Or he missed him and hit it off the wall and or, killed other people. But this lunatic was so armored. How did he get all the ammunition? Well, he got it. He got legally. it. Legally? Legally. Through the mail. That crazy. Through the mail. Is that crazy? Through the mail. It's crazy. And, when, and thousands of rounds. And when questioned, somebody said, well, if you target practice, that's not unusual to buy thousands <laughs> of rounds of ammunition. Yeah. Oh. There are other sports. Try tennis. Yeah. What do you make of the election? Oh, interesting. Ooh, Ooh interesting. Um, well, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not crazy about either candidate. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not wild about either candidate. You are a Democrat, though. I think you told me that. I'm not a registered anything. I'm a registered independent, so I actually don't get to vote in primaries. You're an Ed Koch person. I'm an Ed Koch kind of person. Always, I'm, I'm, totally I'm, what I'm, I'm actually, I'm also a Mike Bloomberg kind of person, and he's been on, he's been a Democrat, yeah. he's been a Republican, he's been a Bloomberg guy, mm -hmm. he, you know, he is, he, he's been all over the board. But I think he's a, f a fine business person, and running a city is running a, bi is running a big business. I think that he's got a... So you don't know who you're going to vote for? Oh, I, I know who I'm going to vote for, but I'm not telling you. I understand. I know who I voted for last time. Who? Obama. What did you, were you surprised that John Roberts swung the Supreme Court the other way on the health care bill? Yes. And Ruling I it was a tax, and therefore con Congress can pass a tax. Yes. It was, that was sort of cute. <laughs> finding, well, if you finding, choose not to buy it, you're taxed. You're either taxed or fined. Fine. Or fined. Uh, you know, uh, it's really no different from the federal government giving you money to build aid to buy, build roads, in, mm. but you have to enforce a speed limit on public highways. And if you choose not to enforce a speed limit, then you, you don't get, get the, the money. money. Right. You don't get the money. Were you surprised at the decision? I was. 
And then again, you know, I'm never surprised at... Uh, the court. No. Any court. Any court. Any jury. Right. Do you like to run for office? Never. Come on, Judy. Never. Uh, and, there's, and there's a valid reason. I don't think that any elected official can really make substantial change because the process of change is so cumbersome. And when you've been a family court judge like I have, and in the family court for 25 years, and then in this wonderful job for 17 years, it's like a monarchy. <laughs> you know, you make a decision, and that's it. And then you walk, you get up and you walk out, and you say, now you deal with it. I made, the, I made the decision. But as president, as governor, as mayor, you have so many checks and balances, even if you want to do the right thing. And even if what you plan on doing is the right thing, getting it done is virtually impossible. John Kennedy once said what people would mostly like is a kind king. <laughs> right. Coming up, Judge Judy and I discuss our plans to take over the internet. And she'll answer your questions. Stay with us. We're back with Judge Judy, 17 years. Well, they said it wouldn't last. Uh, we're both uh, heading into unfamiliar territory, me with this show on the internet, which is kind of a flip to me. I'm enjoying every minute of it. And you now have a website, whatwouldjudysay.com. Tell me about that. I was so afraid of this, what I call the machine. Other people call it a computer. I could not figure out how to work it. And I didn't for 15, 20 years. And then I decided, you know what, you really have to, this is, this is the 21st century and you're either gonna get with it or you're gonna be booted out of it. So I said, you know what, I would like to find out what other people think about issues that really interested me over the last 40 years of work. Um, and I think that sometimes people would be interested in my responses to some of the questions that plague us. Do you have a prenup or do you not have a prenup? Do you live with the guy? Do you not live with the guy? Uh, when do you get divorced and who gets the kids? All of those are, the, where, where in this complex world of, you know, first marriages, second marriages, children, stepchildren, half siblings, and all the other things, where are you laid to rest? <laughs> You know, uh -huh. you know, where do you, 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 so you're, or in the middle. You're into it. So I pose questions on what would Judy say twice a month. And you tell me your stories. I want to hear your stories. Maybe some of your stories and the way you've handled your finances, your stepchildren, your former spouse, whatever issue it is that we're talking about, maybe it'll help somebody else. Maybe How's it'll it guide. Doing? It's doing great, and I'm having a good time with it. It's like a voyeur into somebody <laughs> else's life. Are you technologically savvy? Absolutely not. Me too. I've never tweeted, twittered. Oh, I text, tweet. Uh, I, you tweet. Do, I don't know how to do that. I dictate it. I don't type it, but I dictate it. You dictate it to somebody that does yeah, it. that does it, yeah. Oh, well, you know, I, I don't... I wouldn't know how to do it. Well, I don't know how to do it. I'm supposed to... So you're, you're doing do nothing. Do you text? I do nothing. I do not text. Do not text. I do not text. I think that texting is going... When they open up the time capsule for 2000, 2000 2012, 2020, they're going to find that what brought down <laughs> us as a civilization <laughs> is texting. Yeah. Because there's no personal involvement anymore. Nothing. You can do any. You can get out of a relationship. You can do anything Nothing. with a text. And you sit in restaurants with and people, people are and say they the are up here. They, 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 the lightest. I'm having dinner alone. I'm with six people, but I'm alone. Boom. We have some questions from Twitter and Facebook and Reddit for you. Christopher from Reddit says, "Are you a libertarian? You always come across as someone who is for personal responsibility." you consider yourself a libertarian? I don't. I don't like to put a label on it. I think that be, having personal responsibility is just the right thing to do. Why do you have to put a label on it? I think that that's where so much of our politics goes off these days. You know, if you say something, if you say, you know what, I think that if all you can afford to have is three children, that's all you should have is three children. They say, oh, you're a conservative. You're a conservative, therefore you are. Uh. Yeah. It's ridiculous. The civilized discourse has disappeared because we try to put labels on people whose opinions we don't necessarily agree with. Travis on Facebook asks, do you like the people's court? By the way, did that show affect you when you were just a judge? Who was the guy who hosted it? Uh, judge Wapner. Oh, uh, Wapner. I liked judge him. Judge Wapner. 
Well, Judge he Robert, started it. He started mm. it. He started it. He broke the ground. He, he's not crazy about me. No? No. Not you crazy about big. me. He doesn't like, no, doesn't like my style. Oh. Does it, he, what do you make of all the, the, the court shows? Well, you know, I think that since Somebody the law, like <laughs> since the law is something about which everybody can offer an opinion, I mean, you can sit here and you can ask non-lawyers what they thought of the sure. United States Supreme Court case, what they think about gun control, what they think mm. about the death penalty, what they think about a variety of things that affect the law, and you don't have to be a lawyer to give an answer. So I think that that's why court shows are popular. John from Reddit asks, what was the most difficult case? Did you ever have a case in which you made a decision, went back and thought, did I do the right thing? Was this correct? Did I make a mistake? No, I had a case, if I, you ask me what was my most difficult case that I ever had to try, and I don't know how much time we have. Do we have a little bit of time? Do we have a uh, minute? A minute. Do we have a minute? It was a case involving a Russian woman who lost her child, lost her child to the system in New York. And it was a case that lasted over seven or eight years with a lot of other judges. And it came to me to try to do what I perceived to be the right thing. And it was a gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching case. And I ultimately returned this little boy to his mother. And he was very happy and comfortable in his new home. It was a hard case to do. Judge Judy. You think you may know her, but we'll get to the real Judge Judy in our last segment next. back with a television star, <laughs> S-T-A-H, a star, Judge Judy. A couple of quick things. How's your health? You had a little scare last year. Yeah, it's a year and a half ago. I had a little scare. I think everybody else was more scared than I was, and knock wood, fine. God bless. Yeah. Okay, we like to end some shows with a segment we call If You Only Knew. So, what's your most embarrassing moment? Oh. My most embarrassing moment was my third year in law school where I had answered a question of the professor the day before so I knew it wasn't my turn, so I sort of didn't prepare. And the next day, he called on me again. And the only thing I could say to him was, you called on me yesterday. <laughs> 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 I still That's have funny. nightmares about that. Food you hate the most? Food, I, I love all food, actually. I don't like anything that crawls. You know, somebody handed me a... a you know, a bug to eat that was covered with chocolate, that would not happen. But other than that, if it won't, doesn't eat me, I eat it. I hate eggs. Uh, first thing you thought about when you got up this morning? Was it too late to go to the gym? <laughs> Weirdest talent. Do you have a talent we don't know about? Do you sing in the shower? Mm, I, I sing all the time and I have a terrible voice, but I remember the words from all the old songs from the 50s and 60s. I, know. I don't remember what I did yesterday, but the songs <laughs> I remember. Best advice you ever got? Do the right thing and the right thing will happen. Do you give that same advice to others? All the time. Favorite place to be? Wherever I am. Uh, that's Judy. First person you ever kissed. You remember his name? Marvin. Marvin! High school? Marvin. Probably junior high school. I was precocious. Biggest failure? I don't think that there are any failures. I think just learning experiences. Biggest success this show? No, I think my biggest success is my family. Biggest regret? I don't have any. Oh, I have a regret, but it's not my regret. I, I'm sad that my parents didn't get to see all this stuff, that they weren't yeah. around long enough. To long little enough. Judy. Yeah, I, would, I think about that. I'm hoping that they're watching from someplace. Is there something no one knows about you? Mm, uh, there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about me, and that's the way it's going to stay. You're not shy. No. Have you always been this outgoing? outgoing. Yeah, I, I had a great gift that I probably part DNA and probably uh, nurture, uh, which was my father gave me a great sense of myself. He said, anything you can do, anything you want to do, you can do. You are the best. You are the most terrific. You're the most poised. Short is wonderful. <laughs> he made me feel terrific, and I took that with me the rest of my life. So I was fortunate. Uh, one other thing. You remember Marvin's last name? Levine. Marvin Levine. Where was this? 
in Brooklyn. Where in Brooklyn? Well, I lived on Ocean Avenue. I'm not exactly sure where it was. Probably at some spin the bottle party. I lived on Bay Parkway. Yeah, sure. Marvin. You ever know what happened to Marvin? No. No. And you can't look up Marvin Levine there with 20 million. 20 <laughs> Thank you, darling. Thank you. Always fun. Always thanks to Judge Judy, and thank you for watching. Remember, you can always reach me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.